All right. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, this is the innovations in wastewater treatment session. Oh my gosh. I see a rock star in the back of the room. <laughs> Hi, Holly. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, I'm Jane Harrison with North Carolina Sea Grant. I'm going to moderate our session today. Um, just for the speakers, um, we've got to stick to 20 minutes or less, and we've already lost a few minutes. Um, so I would say try to uh, wrap up your talk within 15 to 18 minutes. Then we may have a, you know, a few moments for questions. And if you don't get a chance to ask a question, stay later or find your favorite speaker at lunch and uh, hang out with them. Um, so without further ado, I wanna get things started with Julia Harrison. She is a PhD candidate at NC State. She is gonna be speaking on in situ sensing data to predict fecal contamination in estuarine waters. Uh, Julia. Hello. Okay. Okay, so can everyone hear me okay? Um, so like Jane said, my name is Julia Harrison. I'm a PhD student here at NC State. Um, today I'll be talking with you all about using in situ sensing data to predict fecal contamination in estuarine waters. And this project is supported by Angela Harris in the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering, Natalie Nelson in the Department of Bio and Ag Engineering, and Chris Osborne in the Department of Marine Earth Sci Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. So current coastal water quality monitoring is done infrequently, leading to lags between management and changes in water quality. And so this can lead to areas being opened after fecal contamination occurs, which may lead to human exposure to disease causing pathogens. But then also on the other hand, if areas stay closed too long, this can lead to economic loss from tourism, but also shellfish harvesting. And currently fecal indicator bacteria are used to assess the quality and safety of our coastal waters. And this process involves a lot of different steps, including sample collection, processing samples, incubation time, which is up to 24 hours and enumeration. And these processes involve resources, time, expertise, and lab facilities. Um, and so the current state of fecal indicator bacteria monitoring includes shellfish sanitation, recreational water quality, um, and these monitoring programs monitor or sample when water is expected to be in pristine conditions, and this leaves many gaps in our understanding of the coastal water quality dynamics. And so one key way to improve our current monitoring and fill those information gaps about the dynamics in these coastal water systems is through the use of high frequency multi-parameter SONs. And so here's a visual of the YSI XO2 SON that we used in our sampling. Um, and then I have listed the different sensors that we included, including FDOM, salinity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, total algae, turbidity, and pH. Tryptophan-like fluorescence uh, was a key sensor in our project because tryptophan-like fluorescence has been seen to correlate closely with E. coli in river systems. And so we were really interested in seeing how that relationship between TLF and fecal indicator bacteria in a brackish system um, just interested in that relationship. Um, so models are becoming more and more used in water quality monitoring, um, but the use of SONs as independent now casting instruments is a more novel aspect, especially in these coastal water systems. So with that, um, our overarching goal and ex or what we're hoping with this study ultimately is to be able to use XO2 SONs or SONs in general, using their data with developed models to supplement regulatory decision-making um, for those coastal systems. And so getting into the objectives of this study specifically, we were able to collect fecal indicator bacteria and SON data over dynamic conditions. So those are visualized in the um, more leftmost panels in this visual. Um, and then with that data, we are able to develop statistical models to predict fecal indicator bacteria using that SON data. And then during model development, also identify SON covariates that best predict the FIB. 
And for our sampling, we conducted sampling um, near Beaufort, North Carolina at Gallant's Channel in the uh, blue square. And in this map, you see areas of red, which are permanent shellfish closures. And our sampling site falls within a permanent shellfish closure, which makes the site interesting from a management perspective. And so going more into the sample collection, um, as I said, we had a XO2 sound, which is the instrument in the visual. And then we also collected samples, um, grab samples for the fecal indicator bacteria enumeration. And um, that included uh, assays for enterococci, E. coli, and total coliforms. And we did these samplings. Um, we did daily samplings and then also high frequency samplings to capture baseline conditions and then also storm flow conditions. And so looking at the fecal indicator bacteria data, we have, we see here on the Y axis, log 10 transformed most probable numbers of these uh, indicator bacterias with enterococci in purple um, and E. coli in this green uh, color and then total coliforms in yellow. Um, in these shaded regions, these show the high frequency sampling. So we are collecting samples every two hours during these sampling events. And um, we have two 48 hour samples that serve as baseline conditions. And then we have two 24 hour samplings uh, at the end of the sampling campaign to try and capture a large storm event. Um, and we can see that storm event on the uh, graph plotted above showing daily precipitation values in inches. And so we see a significant rainfall event at the end of the sampling. And we also see the influence of that rainfall in our fecal indicator bacteria data. We also see thresholds uh, placed on the indicator bacteria plot as uh, dashed lines. So in purple, we have the enterococci um, recreational water quality criteria uh, geometric mean threshold, which is 35 MPN. And then we also have in green, the um, National Shellfish Sanitation Program uh, regulatory threshold for fecal coliforms or E. coli, which is 14 MPN. And then we also, like I said, we had that SON deployed and the SON was able to conduct or collect high frequency measurements every 15 minutes. So this gave us a large amount of data, over 2000 uh, data points for uh, approximately a three week period of sampling. And here we see diurnal patterns, tidal patterns, and also we see influence of that large rainfall event in um, sensors such as salinity. Um, and so here we see uh, the tryptophan signal, which is our tryptophan-like fluorescence um, sensor that we are really interested in uh, in this study. And then we also have the other um, water quality covariates that I mentioned on a slide earlier. And so with this, we were really interested in looking at the different relationships between the indicator bacteria and the water quality covariates. And so here we have a Pearson correlation heat map showing the different relationships between those SON covariates and the indicator bacteria. And here I've grayed everything else out besides the indicator bacteria and their correlations with each other. And so we see high correlation between the three uh, indicator bacteria. Um, however, enterococci and E. coli show the lowest correlation of 0.62. And so there's a lot of data on this visual, um, but here I've great or I've boxed in just the um, indicator bacteria with the different covariates and the, their correlations. Um, and so some interesting relationships we see. Um, high correlation, a high inverse correlation between the indicator bacteria and salinity with total coliforms having the strongest correlation and then um, E. coli showing the least correlation. And then another strong relationship is between FDOM and those indicator bacteria, again, with total coliforms showing the strongest correlation and E. coli showing the weakest correlation. And then lastly, I wanted to point out temperature, which is also an inverse correlation between the indicator bacteria and um, temperature. And so with this data, we had a data set of over 2000 points for SOND uh, data. And then around, or we had 
88 enterococci data points that we sampled for in triplicate. And I'm going to be mostly talking about the enterococci data and the models that we were able to develop with that enterococci data. Um, also, data was partitioned into training and testing sets for model development. And for the models developed, uh, I developed continuous models, including multiple linear regression, random forest, and then also um, binary threshold exceedance models, including logistic regression and a categorical random forest. But today I'll be focusing on those continuous models for the enterococci. And so here I have a table showing um, the multiple linear regression model and their performance, as well as um, our one random forest model shown here. Um, so with these models developed, we only use the predictors from the SON sensors um, and we're able to obtain a very uh, a high performance R squared of around 0.8. And then also using the leaps package in R, I was able to um, subset, uh, optimally subset the predictors to only four predictors and still having a testing R squared of 0.8. And so here's a visual of the model performance. So this is our multiple linear regression model using those four key SON covariates to predict the uh, enterococci. And so here in this visual, we see um, the observations, so the actual data as points, as circles, and then the predict the model's predictive um, values as that um, line. And then we also have the non-detect line. Um, and so we see that our model is performing quite well. It may perform not as adequately at very low concentrations, but it does follow these high um, indicator or these high concentrations of fecal contamination, which is what we really want for management because we mostly care about when the uh, bacteria exceed that threshold of management. And so also with developing these models, I was able to pre or I was able to identify the SON covariates that best predict fecal indicator bacteria concentrations. And those were uh, fluorescent dissolved organic matter, FDOM, salinity, temperature, and tryptophan-like fluorescence. Um, and this is important to identify these covariates as this will help us lower costs as we implement um, models such as this, and then also possibly improve predictive capabilities if we're able to switch in um, different sensors that may even further improve um, model performance. And so some conclusions from this study, um, we were able to capture dynamic coastal conditions um, in our sampling as variability is present in our SOND and uh, fecal indicator bacteria data. And so this is just like recapping, uh, we see that the rainfall event has impacts on this data and we see a wide range in the data. And so our sampling campaign was effective. Um, we also see that our continuous models show high performance in such a highly dynamic estuarine environment. So this R squared is um, quite high for such a dynamic environment. And then also our continuous models display better predictive capability at higher levels of contamination, which um, is important for that management when we care about uh, contamination being above that threshold of exceedance. And so we talked about with this visual. And then also the key care covariates determined in this model agree with existing literature, um, and then also reveal the potential to predict indicator bacteria using only a small set of water quality sensors, um, and those include salinity, temperature, FDOM, and tryptophan-like fluorescence. And so these results highlight the potential for SONS to predict fecal indicator bacteria and reduce the time lag between water sampling and management decisions. So going back to our overarching goal for the implications of this study to utilize SONS and models to supplement that regula those regulatory decisions that help protect those coastal systems. So thank you so much for your time and attention, and I'd like to open the floor for questions. Yes. Oh, 
Um, so shrimp to fan like fluorescent sensors have been used uh, mostly in freshwater systems. Um, also in wastewater systems, they're used to measure uh, BOD or biological or biochemical oxygen demand. Um, and the tryptophan like fluorescence uh, measures peak protein fluorescence. And so it hasn't really been implemented in uh, estuarine water. So that was kind of why we were so interested in it, using it. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm not exactly sure. That's something I'm very interested in looking more into. Um, it possibly could be due to uh, the smaller sample size that we have. Um, so yeah, I'm not exactly sure, but that's definitely a very good point. And I'm, I want to look into why the random forest dropped in the testing. But yeah, I, th I think it might be because of the smaller samples or the smaller size for that testing set. Um, so we didn't do any, like, uh, we weren't looking specifically at nutrients themselves, um, but more so just the data, but that, that is a good point. Um, with looking specifically at the indicator bacteria, we assume its origin is mostly local storm water runoff. Um, and then also that would like runoff would be most mostly the origin of the nutrients as well. Thank you. This will be our last question here. Do you have any sense for how globally applicable a model like this would be? Or would it have to be generated for um, that's something we're very interested in. Um, we have, this is kind of a pilot study and we're doing further studies. Um, I'm very interested in seeing like how the models can be applied spatially. Um, so that's something that we're definitely looking at. Um, it, ideally we could develop a model and it'd be implemented in multiple areas. Um, but I'm expecting that there would have to be a period of model calibration before um, the model is able to be utilized to its fullest capacity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Oh, I'm doing a PDF, so do I need to stop share and then change? Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to moderate myself. So if I go over time, somebody, you can just shout out. <laughs> oh, you tell me, Holly. <laughs> um, I, again, Jane Harrison with North Carolina Sea Grant. I'm based here in Raleigh, and I'm going to be talking about a interdisciplinary project um, that 
we just completed uh, this year. Uh, it was about three years of work, um, and we're really getting into the extension and outreach phase, which is super exciting. Um, my colleague, who is very much um, uh, couldn't do the work <laughs> without him, is Mike O'Driscoll uh, from ECU. Um, uh, past partners are here, Holly White with the town of Nags Head, and then other collaborators as well. Um, Holly of Tetra Tech, who's going to come and talk to us just after I'm done um, about what they've been doing for decentralized wastewater management in Nags Head, so a, a new plan. Um, so this project, lots of partners. It was very much, um, you know, because of needs um, that we were hearing from the coast. So the town of Nags Head, the city of Folly Beach, South Carolina, had identified on-site wastewater treatment as an area of vulnerability, especially with climate change. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a few of those concerns, um, some of our research, and then recommendations that we have from this project. And I did hand out a two-pager that gives you those recommendations. So if you just wanna to get to the end and know what we ought to be doing, um, please turn that page around. You can also go and see some of our publications on the links there. Um, and hopefully we'll have a few more coming up in the next year or so. Um, so again, this is our research team, um, shout out to, Dr. Charles Humphrey at ECU, Dr. O'Driscoll at ECU, Dr. Jared Bowden, he's our climate uh, data scientist on the project, um, Dr. Eric Edwards in the Agricultural and Resource Economics Department at NC State, and then Katie Hill, um, who has a law background, she really helped us to think about some of the regulatory issues that go into managing on-site wastewater treatment. So septic systems in the coastal Carolinas, um, we have a lot, um, especially in North Carolina, on-site wastewater treatment. I've seen stats as high as 50% of households depend on on-site wastewater treatment. Um, so those of us who live in a bigger city like Raleigh or Durham or Wilmington, um, we're gonna have centralized wastewater treatment that has you know, very um, tight controls, um, very common monitoring to make sure that the systems are working. Um, for households that depend on septic, um, they may or, not, may or may not be checking how well their system's working and they're more likely to not be checking on that. Um, so we do have their functionality at risk um, due to climate change and current weather trends. And so in this project, we are really focused on the coastal plain, the outer banks, our barrier islands, um, our rural areas and small towns where we're concerned about the ability of these systems to process contaminants. Um, so whether that's nutrients, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, or fecal bacteria, as we were just talking about earlier. Um, this is just a little bit of a visual to give you a sense of these things. So, you know, a septic system, what happens? You've got a house, a residence, could be, you know, a business underneath it the wastewater, you know, going from your bathroom, it's going to go into a tank, and then it's going to go to a drain field where it disperses out into a soil treatment area. So that is underneath your home. And if you're near a coastal area um, or a surface water, so you have the surface water there and then groundwater once you get onto the land side, and what happens is you need a certain separation distance between you know, the tank and drain field and the groundwater. And the concern with climate change is with sea level rise, we are also seeing groundwater levels rise. And so we're seeing a reduced distance, vertical separation distance for that wastewater treatment. There's a few other factors involved and I'm not gonna go into it all, um, but again, Mike can <laughs> give you the all the details at lunch if you're just, uh, looking for that. Um, I have a couple slides from Jared that I wanna share. Um, he really kind of, he gives the, the sobering maps <laughs> for our team. Um, this is just looking at sea level rise um, close to the town of Nags Head and the Outer Banks. That um, blue circle is right about where Nags Head is. Um, and so you can see by 2040, you know, depending on what scenario you look at, 
intermediate low, intermediate, intermediate high, high, we're going to have about a foot of sea level rise. You know, this is what it will look like in this area. So kind of those lighter blue areas that are taking over what would have been land. Now by 2060 or 2080, depending on the scenario, this is where you're going to see areas of two feet sea level rise. So again, it's this lighter blue area that is starting to take over some of the land base. And then finally, um, three feet of sea level rise, it is expected um, by 2100 or 2080, depending on the scenario that you use. Um, again, just in those lighter blue areas. Um, so a lot of concerns for how do we continue to, um, you know, to be resilient, to live in these areas that are facing this kind of environmental hazard. So I'm gonna just move on. I've got about 70 slides, but I don't think I have time. <laughs> I could be wrong, you know. Um, let's see. I like to do. Oh, this is a nice one. Um, Mike, is this your slide? Yeah, good one. <laughs> um, this is just another, uh, I think, a good visual for what's going on. So currently, the requirement for North Carolina for vertical separation distance is about a foot and a half between the groundwater and where your dispersal field is, um, between the drain field and the groundwater. Um, some studies suggest this really needs to be two feet or higher for adequate soil treatment. And then if we're having groundwaters rising over time, you know, the systems when they're put into place, no one is going back to see if you're still maintaining that particular vertical separation distance. So that's, that's the major concern here. Um, going to move on a little bit. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, I think I like this one. Nope. Oh, okay. Yeah, so some of our research is actually looking at water quality. Um, and so, you know, assessing how these systems do throughout coastal North Carolina and South Carolina. Um, we're monitoring groundwater levels through this project. We're monitoring water quality. Um, we're looking at some of the economics of how do we adjust and use different systems? What kind of incentives can be put into place from a regulatory perspective? But on the water quality side, this is what we're focused on, nitrogen treatment, phosphorus treatment, and bacteria treatment. So how are our current septic systems doing? Um, and not just our conventional systems, but also systems like package plants or cluster plants. So a lot of newer developments, they're going to have a system that, you know, takes care of a larger development area. Um, and so those systems, they operate a little bit differently than a conventional uh, septic system. And these are our monitoring locations for water quality. So you can see mostly in North Carolina, within the coastal plain and our barrier islands. And then we also had one site in Folly Beach. This is uh, again, the work of Mike and Charlie. So monitoring these systems, um, installing wells near drain field trenches for groundwater collection and characterization. Um, and I'm just gonna get you to the kind of Final, what did we find out? Do, do, do. Here we go. Um, so they did assess centralized sewer as well. Um, and they found that it was most efficient at nitrogen removal, whereas our septic systems were actually more efficient than our centralized uh, sewer at phosphorus removal. Um, all technologies are efficient for uh, bacteria removal, but ultimately the septic systems that were working, the ones that we were monitoring, those are ones that are able to maintain that separation to groundwater to effectively treat wastewater. If I had a little more time, I'd go into the details. There's some systems that are working really pretty well. And we had a couple that, you know, ooh, uh, are pretty, pretty bad situations. So it's, um, it's a mixed bag of what you see out there. Um, we did have an economic analysis, not going to get into that. This is, this is all just a teaser. You guys are like, wow, I can't wait to read all of our reports. Um, so sorry, I don't have time to get to them all. Um, this was a piece that I was involved in. So we actually interviewed um, about 30 um, on-site wastewater treatment operators, installers, and health regulators to really ask them what had they seen in their own work experience 
when it comes to climate impacts on on-site wastewater treatment and you know what needs to happen. So first, um, they very clearly explain that weather and climate are not um, part of their decision making. So you know when they are going out to install a system to decide whether to provide a permit, it's really a snapshot. So you know what's going on that day is what matters. Um, and so again, site approval, system selection are not going to account for weather or climate. Um, what they also explained um, for those that were concerned about climate risks, and many were, many were certainly concerned just about the current, you know, kind of weather situations that they've dealt with in recent times, is that our current regulations are inadequate. Um, one uh, spot of hope, I will say, is that they were still oftentimes implementing some kind of resilience measures. So I talked to operators and installers who are being more conservative in their installation. So they were actually building out a little additional vertical separation distance just to be safe. They are making the tanks a little bigger than maybe otherwise is required. So they're aware that having a little bit of extra caution is going to allow those systems to be more functional with time. Um, and then finally, from those interviews, what we really saw as needed is adaptive capacity. And so the way we think about that in this work is education and communication with system owners so that those owners have the ability to do what is needed to take care of the system. There's really that lack of information um, for many you know, system owners about how their system works, whether there's a problem, what would they do about it? Do they have the money to take care of an issue? Um, you know, many of these systems you know, at least when we were talking a few years ago, the most conventional system might be $10,000. Now with inflation, I have no idea, 50,000 for a nice system. So maybe an advanced system. Yeah, so, I mean, that gets to a point, you know, it's, uh, if you can avoid it, you probably will. Because <laughs> um, that's a big cost for, for most folks. Um, in terms of our recommendations from the research, you know, some of the, this is very simple, but it's still things that we're not seeing happening on a regular basis. So number one, we really have to maintain these on-site systems for proper functionality. Um, when there is routine inspection, when there are pump outs, um, they can work great. When you have the vertical separation distance, this is, can be a great choice. Um, we need to identify poorly performing systems for upgrades and maintenance. So again, that is not happening on any regular basis. Um, we do recommend converting conventional systems to advanced or package treatment when that vertical separation distance is insufficient. So that may be something that has to happen in these areas that are going to be experiencing these higher groundwater levels. Um, and then also, when possible, to connect households with, with chronically underperforming systems to centralized wastewater treatment. That's something we're seeing a lot in Miami, um, Florida, that's dealing with these issues. You know, it could be in Norfolk, but when we're in more rural areas that don't have a centralized system nearby, you know, you really don't have that option. Um, number two, we would love to see incorporation of weather and climate risk in the siting and selection, the approval of these systems to consider the risks of acute failure due to extreme precipitation, sea level rise, and groundwater level changes. Um, I'm, I guess I maybe I'm not the most hopeful that this is going to happen. I realize from a regulatory standpoint, it's much nicer just to have one number that we use all the time. <laughs> Um, but it's something we have to think about. And if we can only use one number, then let's use a bigger number than 1.5 feet because it's probably not going to take care of the job, especially in our coastal areas. Um, number three, again, like I was saying, building adaptive capacity in our coastal communities that are at high risk for climate impacts. Um, you know, this project was very much driven by, I'd say, the um, leadership um, by communities like Nags Head, like Folly Beach, who are focused on these issues and have been doing their best and really being leaders um, in terms of providing incentives and programs for their own house, their own residents uh, to upgrade their systems. And so we have to involve a lot of different stakeholders to raise awareness about these issues and to provide the, you know, really the opportunities for folks to make investments in this space. 
Number four, this is something um, I do think is doable um, and I hear talk about it. Um, it is creating um, digital long-term inventories of these systems so that we can actually monitor and evaluate them regularly. There are still many counties in North Carolina where all of the information is, you know, paper. It's on paper. It's not in any kind of online database. Um, we, in South Carolina, they actually throw away the on-site wastewater treatment permits after five years. So they have a permit and then they, they destroy it. Um, and, uh, it seems like an easy fix. Just don't throw it away. <laughs> uh, let's keep it. Let's digitize it um, so that we can start monitoring systems and have some information to determine, you know, system location, uh, age, type, depth to water table, land service, surface elevation, condition, repair permits, history of malfunction. So that for communities that want to make investments in this space, they could figure out, oh yeah, this part of town, you know, we want to offer this particular rebate um, or a pump out program. You know, this is where we're going to be most effective. Uh, number five, educating local governments on the extent of their authority to regulate these systems. That's something we've been doing through this project. Um, you know, there's still a lot of other actors that have to be involved. So the state side, um, county health departments. And so it's a lot of different folks that have to be part of the conversation. Um, number six, um, there was a recommendation from our economics team to upgrade cesspools and straight discharge systems first. So we do have a whole um, uh, kind of section of our report, our final report that talks about how do you uh, reduce the most pollution at the lowest cost. And so making sure that we're you know, spending our money wisely, our scarce resources. Um, another uh, recommendation that came out is set aside, setting aside land. So on the municipal side for cluster systems. So anywhere where you are seeing that vertical separation distance um, being a concern at the household level, maybe we need to have systems again in a cluster or package system in a different spot. Um, and one of the major costs or barriers is just having the land available. So if the municipality has that option, that can make those systems much more uh, possible. And then finally, number eight, assess feasibility of reusing wastewater to reduce the use of deeper groundwater and prevent subsidence. So this is a topic that I didn't get into because it's complicated and it's all Mike. Um, and, but this is another kind of interesting issue. You know, there's more than sea level rise that is affecting the groundwater levels. And so we have to look at these multiple dynamics um, that are affecting wastewater treatment in these systems. Um, with that, I'm gonna conclude. Um, Mike, do you wanna add anything? Any important takeaways? <laughs> It's a really good challenge if you put it back across the lines of the winter. So, figuring mm -hmm. out if you want to fix some of these systems to really slightly mm -hmm. keep the groundwater less with that, then figuring out mm -hmm. how to keep it there. Because you can get money for centralized infrastructure sometimes for things, but for decentralized, same thing with private wells, cross transmission. Yeah, thanks. Uh, questions for me or Mike? Yeah, in the back. The question. Um, should the centralized wastewater be, does not be anything possible in the central? Centralized, you work with the being in between pretty much the phosphorus, which I'll say you can add aluminum phosphorus. Mm. So pretty commonly, if there's a permit for a requirement, you're going to add central to central. Mm -hmm. So the ones you look at probably didn't have a phosphorus in it and weren't trying to do that. So Charlie, mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious, uh, you're an expert on this, but it is interesting. Mm -hmm. Particularly the packing piece, um, the adaptation of the phosphorus flow. And we sat that recent because you might not see the report back. So there are some program type solutions because we're going to have to drop our lot off in salt and we have a lot of new ones that are new, but we can use phosphorus. But the winter, that's not one of the ones that's needed. 
it is a car. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's not a true electric so you design the system in the car. I don't know if I can do not the law in the Garrett County point of view. Um, look at the stormwater. There's a series of ditches that don't work very well. Let's just perhaps look at pump drainage and get the the groundwater. Look at the state of groundwater. Look at stormwater stacking up and mm -hmm. this is what this is. So we found here the mm -hmm. ditches and clear out what we have. I didn't really see that in the stormwater stuff. Mm -hmm. Now that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Oh, time wise. Thank you, Holly. Yeah, why don't you come on up? I do see one more question back here. If you want to go ahead while I get the next presentation up. <laughs> so, you see what we're saying? That's how we're saying. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome. Can you all hear me okay? Excellent. Good deal. Oh. Are we sharing the wrong one? Yeah. <gasps> Sorry. You think after how long? Uh, two, years. two years we'd get this figured out, but that's okay. Um, so I'm going to build upon all of the things that we've already heard today. So thank you for your great question. Um, from, from Aqua back there, but um, my name is Holly Miller. I'm with Tetra Tech. I'm an engineer. I actually helped um, redo or update the town of Nags Head decentralized wastewater management plan. So uh, back in what the late 90s, the, the town had the foresight to really think about septic. And because they are a coastal community, it's on the forefront of their mind. It's part of the tourism. It's part of economy. It's the driver. And in Nags Head in particular, there's no central so, well, I take that back. There are a few areas that do have a central sewer, but for the most part, about 81% of the community is on septic systems. And you can imagine with what we've heard today from Dr. Harrison and Julia, that, um, that it's a challenge. It was sea level rise, brown water infiltration coming up. Septic is maybe not the best situation, and how do we handle that? So the, the town of an Ag's head has developed a really great plan called the um, Todd D. Craft Septic Health Initiative. Sorry, I haven't said that in a couple of months, so it didn't roll off the tongue as it usually does. Um, so it's, it's really great incentives for homeowners. So I'm just going to go over some basic information, and then I'm going to dive into um, some of the risk that Dr. Harrison was talking about, and we're going to go into that a little bit more. So I will get started if, okay, great. It didn't change on here before it changed up there. So, so just, just overview, we've already heard this. There's over 21 million septic systems in the U.S., North Carolina, particularly in the coast, is about 2 million systems. And if we think about general hazard mitigation plans, they usually don't identify septic 
as an issue. Obviously, for living in homes without wastewater treatment, that is a problem. So in, in a hazard mitigation world, emergency management world, it's something that needs to be included within those plans. If you can't reside in that home, why is the home even there? So we really need to think about that from a, a future perspective and integrate that into plans as well. In addition, as Dr. Harrison mentioned, they're not usually maintained. I, I, we just saw that a couple of us here in this room do have septic systems. They're supposed to be pumped out every three to five years, depending on usage. I think I haven't pumped mine out in the last five years. So it's on my to-do list, but it's always on everyone's to-do list to remember to pump it out. Unless you've got it on your calendar, you forget. And that happens all of the time. And then that leads to failures typically, or sometimes people don't pump them out at all. So you have immediate failure of septic systems. And then that septic effluent goes directly into our recreational waters, into our swimming areas and our beaches and our sounds and our estuaries, and that affects our fishing. So um, I'm gonna move on and talk a little bit more about the decentralized wastewater management plan itself. There was a great deal of stakeholder and community input into this update of the plan. It really spoke to all of the operators, similar to uh, what Dr. Harrison uh, spoke to earlier. And we, we also talked to a lot of the business owners in the area. How does it affect them? What challenges do they have? And then there, we also spoke to some residential uh, folks as well as the multiple different parks and state facilities. How are they dealing with septic and, and wastewater treatment? And is it affecting their property as well. So we got a lot of great input and that really is really the base of the update of the plan. We, we started to look at a new mission, vision, goals. And we really thought about, is, is the septic going to be um, a, a change or a challenge or is it going to be what it previously was? So we updated that thinking about future conditions, looking at sea level rise and integrating that into the plan as well. In addition, uh, we looked at groundwater in interface. As uh, you, we talked about, Mike was here earlier. He actually helped us look at six locations across Nags Head, and they uh, did groundwater studying at wastewater treatment, as well as on-site septic systems and in groundwater wells. So we got a really great idea of where the groundwater table was in Nags Head, and we could determine if it was actually coming up into the leach fields and having direct effluent mixing. And as I mentioned, we looked at those future conditions and then funding opportunities. We just heard that there's not a lot of funding opportunities for septic. EPA has got some, but we're seeing huge influxes in infrastructure for bridges, transportation, wastewater treatment, water, uh, but not septic. And, that, and that's a problem when you've got 21 million people on septic systems and they can't afford to pay for a $50,000 advanced treatment or even a $10,000 single family home. So here are just some of the plans that we utilize to help develop the update of the decentralized wastewater management plan. Uh, the town had developed a really great vulnerability uh, consequences plan. It's called VCAPS, as well as the climate science report. That's what we're getting the low, medium, and high different flooding levels from, as well as a comprehensive plan. Where is the development going to be happening? And Nag said, how is it going to change? What are the different zoning types in that area? And in Nag said in particular, they have large lots in Nag said on purpose because they want to be on septic. They don't want to have high levels of growth increased density and really keep that feel for the community. So it's something that was integrated into, into this as well. And so with that groundwater analysis um, that was integrated into the decentralized wastewater management plan update, I mentioned that we looked at six locations. We already talked about the vertical separation distance of that one and a half feet. So here's just another visual of what that looks like. So typically your septic leach field is within that first top two feet, and then you've got your one and a half feet below. So you've got three and a half feet total. And so Mike and his group over at ECU looked at that data for us and really determined what that looked like um, across the area. So we could really figure out a risk determination for the decentralized wastewater management plan. So of those six sites, and I wanted to kind of hone in this specifically as opposed to the whole entire decentralized wastewater management plan itself, 
the groundwater data itself was the driver really for the plan update. It was a catalyst for change. And so I wanted to heavy get into this data and really help you understand why this change has affected the plan so much. So of those six sites, three of them were below those requirements. They did not have that one and a half foot of vertical separation distance. So you could see that we've already got failing systems across NAGSAD. And there were two sites that were at or above requirements. Um, they, they had some separation distance, but it wasn't significant. And then there was one site up at Bonnet Street, uh, the northern part of NAGS had that only uh, was above, well above their requirements. So in general, if we looked at all six of these sites in particular, we determined that there was um, an average mean sea level of the parcels that were at or above vertical separation distance. It was seven feet, it was kind of like our, our line of um, where that elevation needed to be for, where you didn't have a vertical separation challenge. So what we did is we, we think, thought about risk analysis and we dove into what that looks like. So here's just a map of elevations in Nags Head. You can see the areas uh, with low mean sea elevation are kind of a greenish color and then high elevation or a, a orange or even a red. So you can see most of it is primarily green, really low mean sea elevation, but there are some areas of, of high elevation that didn't have septic challenges. So what we did is in the decentralized wastewater management plan, we focused on those risk areas for potential failure of decentralized wastewater management plan and adapted the plan based on that potential risk of failure and the potential water quality issues as well. And then there's just another uh, depth to groundwater. So they correlated together and there was, um, there's a direct correlation there. So with, with Mike's data that he, um, he did for the last year, um, getting those groundwater elevations, we can see that his sea level rise elevation and his groundwater depth elevation actually eventually come together. And you can see sea level rise out in 2025 or later um, is rising at um, a steady rate, but actually groundwater depth was rising at a quicker rate and groundwater depth is actually going to surpass sea level rise. So it was a very poignant moment where we realized that the challenge wasn't going to be sea level rise and Niag said it was actually going to be groundwater infiltration. And so what we did is thinking about that, what is that risk going to do to septic in Nags Head. So we looked further at metrics to determine if septic was still even viable in Nags Head. So we looked at land surface elevation, that seven foot mean sea elevation, depth to groundwater if it was between 36 and 24 inches, proximity to stormwater infrastructure, and um, to see if there was an interface between stormwater as well as uh, surface water. Uh, if you're close to surface water, if it had any effect on the septic system as well. And then if there's any environmentally sensitive areas. And then obviously poor observed water quality. So NAGSAD has a great program. It's not an in-situ uh, monitoring. They do uh, grab samples and they have a, a YSI meter, um, but they are still doing hand samples to gather their data. Um, and the, but the data didn't correlate to any specific failure locations. You couldn't pinpoint the problem areas. So what we did is we took all of those metrics and we determined low, medium, and high risk areas that the town really needs to focus on to think about cluster systems, to think about these areas are very challenging. And if there is an issue with these homes, either now or in the future, does it need to become a buyout? Does it need to become public property? Or is that home still gonna be able to survive in that location? So of all of the homes that were on septic, there was a 42% had a low risk, meaning they were, they were okay. Those systems weren't um, terribly challenging. They had a high mean sea elevation. There wasn't a, 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 a low very septic separation area. And then uh, there was a medium risk, which is orange. It's a lot actually on the ocean side, which we didn't think was going to be the challenge, and then the, the high risk, the purple area is around um, 
Actually, the sound side was more challenging than the ocean side. There was less of a vertical separation on the sound side in Nags Head. Um, and that's where a lot of people recreate. They're kayaking in that area. They're playing with their families. It's not the ocean side. It's a little bit different type of feel. So there's actually a potential health issue with that as well. And here's just some more visuals of what that looked like. The picture on the left is northern part of Nags Head. And then the um, picture on the right is just south of Jockey's Ridge, if you're familiar with that area. There was a lot of challenges actually in that picture on the right. Um, those homes were older. They were built before 1980, a lot of them. And the rules actually changed for septic in that time period. So um, a lot of those systems were open bottom septic tanks or even sand filters where they didn't have a, a normal tank type system. So they were directly discharging for the most part into these areas and then filtering through. So there's a lot of water quality violations in that location. A lot of older homes in that area, as I mentioned, and that's where a lot of the um, permanent residents lived as well. And then just here's um, here's the causeway as you come into Nag said, there's some areas in particular that are extremely challenging and they have a lot of um, future potential to have septic failures that are right on the water in that whalebone area. If you can, well, they're in the purple right there in the middle. Um, that area is gonna be very challenging from both sea level rise and groundwater intrusion, but they're on septic right there. They're right out in the middle of the water basically. And then um, the, as you go south, the, um, the areas to the west, that's all right along the Cape Hatteras National Seashore. So those septic fields are actually leaching into the, the septic area or into the, the wetland areas and into the, um, the National Seashore. So that's a, a problem. And they've actually done some sampling at the National Seashore that, that uh, correlated with that as well. Just some here, some more pictures of the same. Again, that purple high risk continues down to the south. So with all of that, I know I dove really deep into the groundwater piece of things, but like I said, it was the, it was the impetus for the change. So with the decentralized wastewater management plan, multiple things are actually happening now and will be happening in the future. So the, the actual um, town of Nags had is increased inspections. So they actually go out and inspect systems for free. You, you make a phone call and you, you, they go out and they actually look at systems for their residents. It's a great program. No one else in the state of North Carolina does that. I don't, I don't know if anywhere else does, but I, I, they're the only ones. So they are very much a model for the whole entire country, dare I say. Um, in addition, there's a pump out credit. So if you want to pump out a, a septic system, it, it typically costs between $300 or $350. It's not really a bank breaker by any means, but at the same time, it, you know, if you're on a fixed income, that could be a little costly. So the town actually helps pay for that by giving you a water bill credit. So they, they actually do purchase water so people aren't on wells necessarily, but they actually increase that from $45 to $150, basically half of the cost of the pump out. That's kind of like skin in the game, right? That's saying we really care. And so that, that's a huge step that is a huge incentive for people to continue to maintain their systems. In addition, as I mentioned, a, a repair or a pump out can, can be pretty costly. A repair can cost 10,000 plus, depending on how much fill you have to bring in, which can actually lead to, to flooding potential problems. Um, but the town actually gives out low interest loans for that or zero interest loans. And um, they actually increase their low interest loan from 7,500 to $12,000 because of that additional cost. In addition, they get, they have a lot of education on their webpage has great information, which is sometimes really hard to find. If you don't know where to look for septic information, they have got it all right there in one, one place. In addition, we recommended that they increase their groundwater monitoring because we only had six sites. Was that an accurate assessment of what was actually going on? Maybe, but um, if you actually get a better spread of the statistics and try to figure out um, a better idea of groundwater, you could get a better idea of what's actually happening. In addition, uh, we suggested that they increased uh, risk analysis as conditions change. 
as we determine what is actually going on with sea level rise, we get better data, we can really figure out what that means from a risk perspective. And then in addition, the town is applying for grants and funding to help with this program as well as help others repair their septic. So with that, that was my last slide. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Yes. <laughs> Correct. Staff has actually trained to do those inspections. Um, so they will go out after a phone call is received and, and do an inspection for an individual homeowner. And then if there is an issue, they'll let the... Correct. Correct. Yes, yeah, so it's part of the Todd D. Craft Septic Health Initiative where that it's part of a incentive for people to say, hey, I think there's something wrong with my septic or can you come take a look at it? And then staff will go out and actually do an inspection on it and then give recommendations of next steps. Yeah, it's it's pretty impressive. Yeah, we had a great conversation with Dare County and they are all for it actually because they don't have very many staff and they really can't get out to these systems. So the town has taken it upon themselves to take that extra initiative and, and go help their residents because they see the, the huge challenges that people are having and the impacts that it will have or potentially does have on water quality as well as recreation and tourism. So it's huge. Yeah, it's really challenging. We didn't look at wells in particular for drinking water standards, but yes, that, that could be a, definitely a challenge as well. Yes. I think it's all of the above. Yes. And, and that was one thing that I didn't talk about because I didn't have oodles of time either is it's, it's it's weird that septic is related to all of those things. It's it's stormwater, it's sea level rise, it's flooding. And because of the, all of those things happen, it affects septic systems. And that, you know, that's people's homes um, in the Outer Bank. So it's it's really challenging. Mike could probably answer that question way better. So I would definitely suggest getting up with him. No, they do not. It's all gravity. The The town does have some um, groundwater wells that they will pump down, but they do not have like a pump system. No. Mm -mm. Yep, just gravity. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a lot of challenges in that. Side. Yes. Yeah, actually, there there is a huge uh, influx of of people that have started to use this program more. So we analyzed all of the data since the inception of the program, and and the numbers were kind of all over the place a little bit. But because of the new incentives, um, there there's a lot more potential, especially if you if you're thinking about someone that's on a fixed income. Obviously, you know, there's what five million dollar beach houses out there too, so they probably don't necessarily need you know, $150 rebate on their water bill. But those who are on a fixed income, definitely, I was trying to get to the slide. 
um, they definitely need that. And, and a lot of people take advantage of it in those numbers. Our goal was to actually increase those numbers to try to get at least a quarter of the residents every single year to, to try to hit that three to five year cycle. So everyone gets an inspection every th potentially three to five years because it's free. I mean, how, who would not want a free inspection of your system? I mean, it's a, it's a great incentive. So they're trying to push that a lot and they've, they've done a lot to the, the town website to help push that a little bit more. I think that's probably it, unless there's any more questions. Excellent, thank you. Please come on up and I'll see if I can find yours. Oh, I think I need to stop share. How does that look on your end, Rob? Yeah. Let me see. Maybe. I'm enabling editing. It might have been that. Oh, okay. I'm seeing like that part. Let me share. Do you, um, screen Carol, two. Oh, screen two? Yeah. Okay. Is that his, that's not his first slide. Right? No. We have to go to end show wherever that is. Sorry. No, it's okay. Stop share. This is Sorry. Which is the one that just went? This is the one we'll show. This is the one Patrick. we'll show. Okay. Yeah, Maybe it'll take over if I just hit it. There it is. Okay. Dr. Carroll? Yeah, take it just away. Just Mr. Carroll. Mr. Carroll, take it away. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Patrick Carroll. I'm a research associate at uh, uh, UNCW. And I'm going to go over a little bit of the research that we're doing at our aquaculture facility. Uh, it's associated with the Center for Marine Science. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Dr. Wade Watanabe and Dr. Shah Alam. Uh, the project I'm going to talk about today is the multi-trophic waste management for finfish aquaculture in land-based recirculating aquaculture systems using the salt-tolerant halophyte Salicornia virginica. There we go. So I'm going to uh, give it a little bit of an introduction to the integrated multi-trophic aquaculture system. It is a system which uses waste from one aquatic species as inputs to another. So in the picture above, we have our, uh, our aquaculture or our, our recirculating aquaculture system, which we grow the fish in. Fish produce waste. We remove the waste from the water, which produces nutrient-rich water, and then we grow a salt-tolerant plant. This can also be used to grow seaweed and microalgae. Advantages of this type of system are they can lower cost, uh, production costs by growing a secondary crop. They can conserve water. You can clean up the uh, wastewater to the point where you might be able to reuse some of it and uh, you're pulling less water from the environment then. You can uh, reduce your environmental, uh, environmental effects of the influent. You're cleaning up the, the effluent to a point that uh, it would be much uh, much less dirty than just straight piping the effluent out to the environment. And it can increase social acceptabilities. Uh, one of the black eyes about or for aquaculture is the, uh, uh, the uh, discharge of effluent. So if we can clean that up, it will uh, uh, be a little more socially acceptable. First step or first, part of uh, this type of system is a recirculating aquaculture system. And it, uh, this is a land-based intensive, intensive culture system. And by definition, it is a system which reuses 10% of the system waste, uh, waste or, uh, I'm sorry, uh, reuses 10 or reuses uh, less than, more than 10% of the system water per day. It discharges 10% or less. Um, in the picture we have up here, uh, two tanks right here is about 10,000 gallons. 
Uh, so we exchange about 1,000 gallons or less of the system water a day. Uh, these systems can be very heavily stocked. We can grow about a half of a pound of fish per gallon. So I think your, your 10 gallon fish tank uh, that you've probably seen in people's houses, think of growing a five pound fish in there. Um, this allows us to concentrate the waste stream. That 1,000 gallons of water that comes out of here is uh, very highly concentrated with a lot of fish waste. Um, a flow through aquaculture uh, system might have tens of thousands of gallons of water passing through it a day, makes it a lot more difficult to treat that water. In this system, we grow black sea bass, and we've also uh, worked with uh, grouper and um, southern flounder. Next step in the process is uh, filtering out the waste from the effluent. Um, we use what's called a geotube, and the geotube is a geotextile bag. It comes from the construction industry, where you pump solid uh water in, and the uh, the weave of the fabric helps retain the solids while clarified water passes through. This is very similar to the technology they use for um, for erosion control on shorelines where they pump in sand, they fill the bags up and the bags help with the, the shoreline erosion, but we're using it to actually retain the solids. Uh, in North Carolina, this is, uh, no, or this is an approved, uh, approved as a best management process. Um, this type of system is usually dependent on a chemical polymer. Uh, you pump your waste in and uh, while it's being pumped in, it's mixed with a chemical and that chemical coagulates the solids into one larger part or into larger particles, which makes it a lot easier for that weave to retain the solids. Um, we wanted to use this in a, um, uh, as nutrients for a plant that would be going uh, or for human consumption. So we wanted to eliminate that chem chemical polymer from the process. So I devised the two bag method where you fill up one bag, operate on that for two weeks while another bag dries. And that, uh, that slows down the bacterial um, growth, which would clog the bag. If you operate this bag uh, full time without switching it over, it, it clogs. And uh, we, we had one split on us once, so it uh, wasn't pretty. Um, but this uh, two bag method, actually gets rid of the uh, chemical polymer. It makes it a lot easier to operate also. Now this pleasant picture here is the wastewater sump. So uh, we have six 15 foot tanks that discharge into this wastewater sump, collect all the waste. Once it fills up, it pumps through the geotube and into our clean water sump. And this picture here with the cones is the first picture is, uh, system water taken from the fish tank. The middle cone has the wastewater that was pulled from our dirty water sump. And then the, the cone on the right has the clarified effluent. And you can see it's a dramatic difference. Uh, I've done a, a couple grab samples and we started out in the dirty water sump with uh, total suspended solids over 200 milligrams per liter. And after the geotube, it dropped down to around three uh, three milligrams per liter, which is a 98.5% removal. This is a quick, um, or a very simple picture of what we've got going on here. We've got our six culture tanks with the associated filtration. The filtration removes the solids, we get raw effluent in our dirty water sump, passes through the geotubes, which clarifies it, and uh, releases nutrient rich water, which can then be either uh, discharged out to the environment. We, uh, we can also clean it up a little bit more. Some people use this process. They clean up the water a little bit more, remove the nitrates and the phosphates through uh, filtration, uh, denitrification filtration, and then reuse the water. But in our case, we're using this clarified effluent to grow the salicornia. And we're using Salicornia virginica, which is also known as American glasswort. Uh, it can be seen in restaurants or in some uh, supermarkets as sea beans. In Europe, it's known as samphire. Uh, it's also known as sea asparagus or pickleweed. Um, it is an uh, intertidal marsh plant, and it ranges on the East Coast and the West Coast from uh, Canada all the way down to Mexico. So it's all over the coastal U.S. 
It can be used as a food. Um, the, the, the spikes or the uh, shoots of the plant can be eaten. Um, and this picture right here, this is our sea bass uh, prepared as a sea bass crudo with um, salicornia on it. We have a local restaurant that serves uh, the sea bass that we grow and the salicornia that we grow. Um, it can also be used as a seed crop. The seeds have over 30% uh, lipid content. So it is a good plant-based uh, fatty acid source. Um, it can be used as a, uh, or the biofuel industry is interested in this uh, to make um, uh, plant-based biofuels. Ecologically, it can uh, act as a biofilter, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about here. And it can be used as pollution removal. It uh, is able to remove heavy metals from the soil. And there's also pharmaceutical interests. So the objective of our study, um, first is the overall goal is to demonstrate the advantage of using geotextile bags to dewater marine fish fin, fin fish recirculating aquaculture system discharge and to provide a mean, means to utilize liquid nutrients in the geotube filtrate in an environmentally effective manner by the int integrated multi-trophic aquaculture system uh, with a salt tolerant halophyte. And uh, the experiment I'm gonna talk about uh, in particular, was to optimize and sustain plant growth and uh, dissolved nutrient removal from recirculating aquaculture system effluent by determining the plant yield and nutrient removal capacity of Salicornia virginica under different rates and methods of irrigation. So for the study, we went to the north end of Wrightsville Beach where our, uh, our aquaculture facility is located uh, and behind Shell Island, uh, Shell Island Resort, there is a large salicornia field, went out and dug up some salicornia, washed it off, and salicornia uh, grows off of rhizomes, so we uh, pulled out the plants, washed off the dirt, and got the rhizomes, and then cut them uh, into small segments where it would have a section of roots and a shoot. Then we transplanted those into a hydroponics grow cup and filled it full of clay media. Uh, collected the plants in April of this year um, and acclimated them for 47 days uh, before utilizing them in the experiment. Uh, we chose the 18 best growing plants to move into the experiment. Uh, experimental design, we uh, had three treatments and one control. The first treatment was a 100% effluent treatment. So we took the um, the clarified water post geotube to act as our 100% effluent. We had a 50% effluent, 50% seawater treatment where we just mixed the uh, pure seawater, straight seawater with the 50% effluent. And then we had a 0% effluent treatment, which was just seawater. And then we had a control, which was a 100% effluent with no plant in it. We had six replicates each and they started at a mean weight of around eight grams. The, each grow container was uh, a 15 liter black bucket filled to 14 liters with uh, the effluent. Um, it was kind of grown like a deep water uh, hydroponic system. It was just the roots were extended into a, uh, the bucket of water. Um, each bucket had a, a black cover and a sampling port and a drain down at the bottom so we could do weekly water changes. Um, had a 50 millimeter grow cup with clay media in it. Uh, we had aeration going in to keep the dissolved oxygen greater than 80%. And we had two greenhouses with 12 buckets a piece. Um, to perform the experiment, we did weekly water changes from day zero to day 102. Uh, plants got so big, they started sucking out the nutrients um, faster than we ex expected. So we changed it to uh, two water changes per week up to the termination of the study at day 142. We measured uh, temperature, dissolved oxygen, uh, make sure it was above 80%, uh, salinity, pH, and greenhouse temp. Uh, salinity in the ex experiment was full strength, 33 to 36 parts per thousand. Sample for growth at uh, um, seven points throughout the study. We just sampled fresh weight, which was just pulling out the grow cup, drying off the root mass, and getting an overall weight of the, the plant. We did nutrient sampling. Uh, five different points throughout the study. Um, 
the final sample after water change varied from uh, two to 10 days. Uh, the younger plants early on in the study didn't remove as much nitrogen, so we allowed the uh, nutrient or allowed them the, the uh, effluent to stay in there for 10 days before taking the final sample. Later on, by the end of the study, that was down to two days that they were removing a majority of the nutrients from the sample. Uh, the waste, the, the, the nutrients were analyzed uh, through the uh, North Carolina Department of Agriculture's Agronomic Service Division using the wastewater analysis panel. They looked at all kinds of different types of nitrogen, but I'm going to focus in on the total inorganic nitrogen, which is a combination of ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate, and the phosphate or the phosphorus. So the growth over the 142 days of the study, were, there was a dramatic difference. And starting on by day 63, we saw, we saw the trends established where the 100% effluent treatment was significantly larger than the 50, which was significantly larger than the 0% uh, effluent. And by the end of the study, the 100% treatment uh, remained significantly larger uh, at 1,016 grams 50% only grew to 491 grams, whereas the 0% uh, effluent didn't see much growth at all. We actually saw negative growth after day 86, uh, going to 21.2 grams. This is a little uh, bit of a breakdown of the, uh, of the growth. I'm just going to concentrate mainly on the overall here at the end. Um, the 100% treatment uh, grew at 3.41% uh, plant weight per day, uh, which was significantly higher than the 50%, 2.86, which was also significantly different or uh, larger than the 0%, 0.63. Uh, and just going down to growth rate showed the same exact trend with the 100% treatment growing at 7.10 uh, grams per day, larger than the 3.41 of the 50%. Of the, uh, and you can see, the 0% with out uh, uh, much nutrients in it, we, we started to see them decline in growth. The spikes or the uh, stalks started to dry up and break down. Here's a picture on the uh, left was uh, day zero. And as it progressed, the salicornia and the 0% treatment on day 142, uh, so not a lot of growth, small root mass, the spikes started to dry up, or as you can see, a nice green vibrant plant in, day, in the 50% and 100% treatments. With the 100% treatments, they were getting a little unruly, growing very large, uh, very large root mass. We actually had to terminate the study a little earlier than expected because we couldn't deal with the plants and the size that they were getting. Uh, I'm going to go into the uh, nutrient removal uh, for total inorganic nitrogen up to, ooh, okay. <laughs> uh, the green here is the inorganic nitrogen removal uh, of the 100%, which you can see was significantly higher than uh, the other treatments throughout the whole study. We had this spike on uh, this day 100, and we are uh, thinking that is due to a uh, much higher inorganic nitrogen uh, load going into the system. Um, so the, although we don't have the data to show this right now, the, the higher the in, incoming nutrients, the, the more it can remove. As, so we're, we want to look at in the future, uh, see how, how much it, uh, what the maximum rate of the removal of the inorganic nitrogen will be. Um, this is the overall net percent removal. Uh, again, we'll just focus on the overall. Over the entire course of the study, the 100% treatment removed 82.6% of the uh, nutrients from the water, uh, from the effluent. The 50% came in uh, a little bit lower at 60.6%. Uh, the control only removed 9% of the nitrogen. And you can see the control removed 25% of the inorganic nitrogen, um, which it was about 28.6% of the 100%. They each started with the same water. The grow cup with the clay media had, uh, works as a great biofilter. So it had a lot of uh, nitrifying and denitrifying bacteria on it, which um, led to some uh, uh, nitrogen removal. 
So it's not just the plant removing it from the buckets. Phosphorus uh, saw similar trends um, with the 100% um, treatment removing significantly more uh, phosphorus than the uh, than the 50%, the 0%. The, the 0% throw off the numbers a little bit. Uh, the incoming initial phosphorus was so low that the, the testing methods did not, uh, weren't able to, uh, I guess, read the results properly. So we saw a very uh, skewed number here in the net overall percent removal. Uh, when looking at the uh, percent removal, the, the 100 and the 50% were about the same at 18.9%. Uh, the control negative, or the 0% is negative 43, and then the control at 4.1. If we take this 0% out of the statistics, the 100 and the 50% uh, were uh, significantly higher than the control. And the grow container did remove 17.3% of what the 100% did, and that was due to uh, mainly algae growth. So in conclusion, the marine, uh, marine recirculating aquaculture uh, effluent is effective at uh, growing Salicornia virginica in an inter integrated multi-trophic aquaculture system. Plant growth and inorganic nitrogen removal is higher at 100% effluent than 50% zero. Phosphorus removal is higher uh, in 150% than the 0%. Um, and we saw a maximum removal rate of 173 milligrams of, of nitrogen per day per plant in the 100% effluent. An example on our 10,000 gallon system, fully stocked, we could grow about 5,250 plants to remove all of the nitrogen. Uh, you could likely uh, uh, lessen that amount of plants with, or, uh, with, or uh, grow a lot more plants with higher nitrogen levels. Um, Sounds like a lot of plants in Europe, they have very large farms of this stuff, tens to hundreds of thousands of plants. So it could support a larger farm. Future work, we wanna scale up production using the results from this study, determine the maximum uh, neutral removal capacity and determine the best uh, production systems. And I'd like to acknowledge North Carolina Sea Grant for funding this and the, the staff at the aquaculture facility. Any questions? Yes. I don't as much as I'd like to. Uh, but we, we sell it locally and I go out and get it then, but I wish I ate more fish. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Could you describe the one? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What kind of like harvest schedules do you have to it depends on what, uh, you were doing with them. If you're a food crop, uh, you'd likely harvest it a lot sooner, uh, the younger plants are much better to eat. If you're doing it for uh, seed production, you would do it seasonally. They start uh, setting seeds in September, October, and you would uh, likely harvest them then. And it, uh, I'm not sure what they would, or how it would work uh, seasonal with uh, removal rates or operating a system, uh, say in the winter time, what would you do with your waste? To remove that nitrogen. Yes. Can you plant that so you can migrate in zero percent to see if it migrates to the Not yet. Uh, we're going to send it off for analysis. This just wrapped up a couple weeks ago. I stored the samples and we're going to send them off. Okay. <laughs> any more questions? Yes. Are there any other? The literature says that you can grow livestock off of it. Uh, goats, cows eat it also. Um, we actually are writing grants to use it to incorporate into our fish feeds. Um, harvest it when it's at its maximum protein content and lipid content, and then incorporate that back into our fish feed to feed to our fish. Okay. Thank you guys. Patrick. All right, y'all, it's lunchtime, so please enjoy. Thank you all for being here with us this morning.